Hey guys, I'm Beth from Right to Dream B, and today we are going to be looking at how to solve quadratics by completing the square. Now, to make this feel easier, you should be at least familiar, but better yet, comfortable with factoring perfect squares. If you need a refresher with that skill, then please check out my video, Factoring Perfect Squares and Difference of Two Squares. I'll link it in the description below. But for now, let's get started. Now, before we start talking about completing the square, I do want to do just a really quick review of uh, factoring perfect squares, like I said, because that's going to be sort of the goal for each of these problems and the point that we want to get to. So let's take a quick look at what that looks like. Okay, so here we have a quadratic, x squared minus 8k plus 16, it's a trinomial, and it is a perfect square. And when we're trying to factor a perfect square, what we're going to wind up with is a binomial that is squared. So that's why it's called a perfect square. So remember that when we're trying to factor any trinomial, we're trying to find two numbers that multiply to give us this last term and add to give us this middle term. So when we're talking about perfect squares, that number should be, those two numbers should be the same number. So for 16, what multiplies times itself to give us 16? Well, that would be four times four. But also, we need it to add to make negative 8. So if we made both of these numbers negative, that would still give us, that would still multiply to give us that positive 16, but it would add negative 4 plus negative 4 would give us that negative 8. So that's going to help us with factoring that perfect square. So if we factor it into two separate binomials, it would look like this, x minus 4 and then another x minus 4, right? So another way that we usually write that when it's the same binomial is x minus 4 squared. Okay, so now that we've got that, let's go on to actually using this skill within completing the square. So here we have another trinomial, and we want we are being asked to solve this trinomial. So that means we need to solve for x. So in order to do that, we need an, an equation. So we're going to go ahead and set this equal to 0. And now what we're going to do with this trinomial is just what we did in the last example, and we're going to factor it into a perfect square. But the way that it's set up right now is that 8 and 6, there's no number that multiplies times itself to give us 8, and that would also add to give us 6. So the goal here is to make this trinomial a perfect square. We do that by removing this 8 out of the way. So we're going to subtract it. And again, we're just following simple algebra rules. So if we subtract it from this side, we have to subtract it from the, the other side of the equation as well. And that's going to get rid of that third term for now so that we can put in a third term that works better for this situation so that we can have a perfect square trinomial. So let's go ahead and complete this first step. We're going to subtract 8 from both sides. That gives us x squared plus 6x equals negative 8, right? So I haven't really, I have not changed the value of this equation. I've simply taken away 8 from both sides using that subtraction property. Now, remember I said that we are going to create a trinomial that is a perfect square. So I'm going to go ahead and take these two terms and move them over and just create some space here. I want to use that space to put in that third term that's going to make this a perfect square. So what's going to multiply to give us whatever this mystery number is, whatever this third term is, we don't know what that is yet, and what's going to add to give us positive six. So that's kind of our starting point is this middle term. We're going to use that 6 in order to help us figure out what that third term needs to be for this spot right here. So what two numbers, it has to be the same number because, again, we want it to be a perfect square. So what two numbers add together to give us positive 6? Well, that would be 3 plus 3, right? So then if we use those 3s to help us figure out what this third term is, then we want 3 times 3. So 3 times 3 would be 9. So that's what we're going to plug in here for our third term. Now we can't just add 9 to the left hand side of this equation. We still have to follow those rules of algebra, so we're going to add 9 to this side as well. And then let's simplify that. So we get x squared plus 6x 
plus 9 equals, and then negative 8 plus 9 equals a positive 1. Okay, so again, we are just using the subtraction and addition properties to manipulate this equation so that we wind up with now a perfect square. x squared plus 6x plus 9 is now a perfect square that we can factor. So let's go ahead and factor that. We can break it out into two binomials and then rewrite it as that one squared binomial. I like to do this when I'm first starting out working on this skill with my students because a lot of times we're used to those two binomials and then we can see that they are the same thing and so then we just combine them into one squared binomial. So we, we know that this x squared is going to break out into x and x and then we already know this number that we need in order to multiply to make 9 and add to make 6. We figured it out over here on this side. It's got to be positive 3. So this would be x plus 3 and then this would be x plus 3. And then, of course, we need to finish out our equation by setting it equal to 1. So now, again, we're just going to rewrite this as a squared binomial, x plus 3 squared equals 1. Okay, so now we have completed the factoring section. Now we need to actually solve. At this point, we need to get this equation so that x is by itself. So what are our first steps to do that? Well, right now, this x is being added to another term and it's inside a parenthesis and then that is being squared. So we need to kind of work backwards in order to get that x by itself, right? So we, we're first going to undo this square and the opposite of square is square root. So we're going to take the square root of both sides of this equation. Remember, whatever you do to one side, you have to do to the other. So the square root of x plus 3 squared would just be x plus 3. And then the square root of 1 is 1, but it could be a positive 1 or it could be a negative 1. So let's break that down a little bit uh, because I think that this part is a part that sometimes gets forgotten about a little bit. So let's break that down. What does it mean to take the square root of a number? It means that we're trying to find a number times itself that would give us that number that's inside the square root symbol. So in this case, 1 times 1 equals 1, right? So right there, 1 is a perfect square because it's 1 times 1. But also, we need to think of the negative version of that because negative 1 times negative 1 also equals a positive 1, right? So we're looking at this as two separate answers. The square root of 1 could be positive 1 or it could be negative 1. And so we use the symbol, this plus and minus symbol, to show that this 1 could be positive or it could be negative. So when we're solving for x, that means we have two different scenarios that x could be. x plus 3 could be equal to positive 1 or x plus 3 could be equal to negative 1. So there's two different options here. So it's really important at this point to remember that you need to split it up into two separate equations and solve for x from there. So we just solve for x on both of these equations just like we normally would. We're going to subtract 3 from both sides, and that gives us x equals 1 minus 3 is negative 2, and then we're going to subtract 3 from both sides, again, on this equation. And then when we solve that, we get x equals one, negative 1, and negative 3 is negative 4. So here are our two options, our two answers for x. x could be negative 2, or x could be negative 4. And if we were to go back to the, our original equation and plug in both negative 2 and negative 4, in two separate equations, then we would find that it would satisfy this equation in both ways. So just to recap, the three main steps that we just did here. First, we completed the square right here in this section. Then we factored. And then we solved. So those are your three main steps when you are solving using complete the square. Let's try another example. Okay, so we've got x squared minus 12x 
plus 11 equals 0. And I encourage you to, to pause this video and try it out on your own using those three main steps that we talked about in the last problem, and we'll go through it together. So remember that our first step is that we want to eliminate this third term so that we have room to put in a third term that's going to be a perfect square for us. So we simply take it out of there by subtracting 11 from both sides. And then let's simplify. We should get x squared minus 12x, and I'm going to leave a little space here, equals negative 11, right? Okay, so now we're looking at that middle term because we want this third term to be a number times itself, and it's going to be that same number added to itself to give us negative 12. So let's write it out here. I think this is helpful to begin with. We need two numbers that multiply together. We don't know what those two numbers are yet, but we know that the two numbers need to add to make negative 12. So what two numbers add to make negative 12? That would be negative 6 plus negative 6. Okay. So when we multiply negative 6 times negative 6, that will give us a positive 36. So that tells us our third term that we're going to place into this third position. And of course, we need to add 36 to the other side. Don't forget that step. That's often a common place where students forget to add it in because they work so hard to figure out what this third term is and they forget to add it to the other side of the equation. So that's important to keep the equation balanced. So now we're ready to simplify. Let's go ahead and simplify this part. So we have x squared minus 12x plus 36 equals negative 11 plus 36 will give us a positive 25. All right, now we're ready to move on to that step two of factoring. If you need to write out your two binomials here, go ahead and do that but we can kind of skip that step and have a little bit of a shortcut. We know that whatever we're going to factor this to, it's going to be a squared binomial. We know that it's going to be x plus or minus something, and we actually we already know what that something is because of this work that we did over here. We know that mystery number has to be negative 6. So this has to be x minus 6 squared equals 25. All right, now we're on to step three, which is solving. We're going to take the square root of both of the sides of this equation. And anything squared, if we take the square root of it, it's just going to undo that squaring. So we've got x minus 6 equals, and then the square root of 25. 25 is 5 times 5, right? Or it could also be negative 5 times negative 5. So we've got plus or minus 5. So again, that plus or minus indicates that this 5 could be positive or it could be negative. So now we need to continue solving by splitting this up into two equations because we're going to have two possibilities that x could equal. So we've got x minus 6 equals positive 5, or we can have x minus 6 equals negative 5. We're going to solve both of these the same way by adding 6 to both sides of the equation. And for this first one, we get x equals 11. 5 plus 6 is 11. And then again, adding 6 to both sides of the equation over here, which gives us x equals negative 5 plus 6 is positive 1. So here are our two values for x. And again, you can check your work by plugging these in for x and solving the original equation. Try it with 11 first, and then try it with 1. See if it actually works out for this equation both ways. OK, I've got another one for you. x squared minus 14x minus 38 equals 0. This one, I will tell you that this one is a little bit different than the two that we've done before, so I'm going to call this a challenge problem. But again, I encourage you to pause it, try it on your own, and then come back and we'll work through it together to see how well you did. So the first step is to complete the square. So we're going to get rid of that third term by adding 38 to both sides. Get it out of the way there. Let's go ahead and simplify. So we should get x squared minus 14x, leave a little space for ourselves, equals 38. 
And then let's figure out what that middle term needs to be. I'm sorry, not middle term, what that last term needs to be based on the middle term. So we're thinking what's going to add to give us negative 14, or another way to think about it is what's half of negative 14. So half of negative 14 is negative seven, right? And then we're going to square that. So negative seven squared equals positive 49. So that's gonna give us our third term. Oops, 49, not 39, there we go. All right, and then of course we need to add it to both sides of the equation. We have to keep that equation balanced. And let's simplify to finish up this step of completing the square. So we've got equals 38 plus 49 is 87. Okay, great. All right, now we're on to that second step of factoring. We know that this is now a perfect square. We've just made it into a perfect square. So let's go ahead and set up that binomial, that squared binomial. We know it's going to be x plus or minus something and that something is gonna be this magic number that we came up with before. So that's got to be minus seven, x minus seven squared equals 87. So, so far all of this looks just like the problems that we've done before. In this next step when we're solving, this is when it's gonna look a little different because 87 is not a perfect square. So when we go to find the square root of both sides of the equation, we can simplify this part over here pretty easily, x minus seven, but since 87 is not a perfect square, you would want to simplify any square roots that you might come across. However, 87 can't be simplified, so we're just gonna leave it as square root of 87. It's not only gonna be just square root of 87, it's going to be plus or minus the square root of 87. Now you could absolutely plug this into your calculator and find the square root of 87. You would get a big long decimal, but honestly, this is the way that it is typically written because this is the most accurate way to represent this number is by just leaving it in the square root form. However, when we're solving this, when we're continuing to solve it, it's going to make your answer look a little bit different than the answers that we've seen before. The rules are still the same though. We still need to break this up into two separate equations because that square root of 87 could be negative or it could be positive. So we need to find both of those ways. So we're going to set up x minus seven equals positive square root of 87, or we could have x minus seven equals negative square root of 87. And we're solving it the same way. By adding seven to both sides, we eliminate that seven over here, that negative seven over here, and then x equals, these two are not like terms. We cannot combine 87 and, sorry, square root of 87 and seven as if they were the same type of terms. So we just keep them separate. So it's just going to be seven plus the square root of 87. Same thing for over here. When we add seven to both sides of the equation, which is gonna give us x equals positive seven minus the square root of 87. So as you can see, our answers look a little bit different than the problems that we've done before. However, we still follow the same rules. Let's go on to some variations that you may see. So far, all of the problems that we've done have been pretty much in the same type of format with an x squared term, an x term, and a constant and there are no, there's no coefficient uh, before the x squared terms. So let me show you a few other variations that you might see so that you know how to attack these different types of problems. So sometimes you may need to factor out the greatest common factor because we want this coefficient that's with our x squared term to be one. So in all the problems that we've done so far, that coefficient has been one. So I wanted to show you what that looks like when your coefficient is not one. So the first part of this is actually gonna look pretty similar to what we've already done. We want to get rid of this third term just like we did before. So we're going to add 48 to both sides of the equation and then simplify. So now we've got six x squared plus 12 x equals 48. Okay, so far so good. But like I said, we do not want that six there in that position. So we're going to factor it out by dividing both of these terms by six. So when we rewrite that, that's going to look like this. It's going to have a six on the outside of our set of parentheses. 
and then we're just going to factor it out of each of these terms. These sixes cancel out, which is what we wanted. That's why we chose six, so that we just get x squared. And then 12 divided by six would give us a two x. And then when, again, we're going, we're going to leave that third space open and that equals 48. So we haven't really deviated too much from what we've done before, but this is where I want you to be careful. When you are completing that square, you're finding half of the second term and then squaring it in order to find your third term. So in this case, half of two is one, and then one squared is going to be one. So we're gonna add one right here as this third term. But a big mistake that students often make is that they will then add one on this side. And that's really not keeping this equation balanced. Because remember, then we're anything that we add to anything inside the set of parentheses needs to be multiplied by that outside coefficient. So by adding one here, what we're really doing is adding six to this side of the equation because six times one is six. So instead of adding one here, we need to add six to this side of the equation. And you're going to continue solving it just like you normally would, but with this six added onto this side instead of a one. So I'm not going to continue solving out all of these problems just because I don't want this video to get too long. I just wanna give you a little look at what you might see, some different variations that you might see so that you know how to attack these problems. So the other thing that you might see are problems that you need to rewrite in standard form. So they might look like this. So here we see x squared plus two x equals negative 20. We don't see that standard form over here on the left-hand side because we don't have that C term, that third term, that constant term. So with this particular problem, this is actually okay the way that it's set up because this is, it's sort of doing the first step for us. If this had plus 20 here equals zero, then what would we do? We would subtract 20 from both sides of the equation. Well, in this step, it's already sort of done that for us. So the only thing that I would do for this one is just rewrite it, leave myself a little bit of space, equals negative 20, and now you can continue with finding that third term in order to complete the square. In this example, we have two terms that are over here on the, on the right-hand side and one term that's over here on the left-hand side. Now, when we're trying to complete the square, we want that x squared and the x term over on the left-hand side, and then the constant term can stay over on the right-hand side, just like in this example that I just showed you. So for this example, all we would want to do is subtract 8x from both sides to get that x term back over to the left-hand side. This is gonna cancel out over here, and that's gonna give us 3x squared minus 8x, we're gonna leave that space, equals negative four. And now you're set up so that you can complete that third term in order to complete the square. Now you might also see an equation with a negative ax squared term. That first term could be negative. This sort of follows similar rules as factoring the GCF. We're basically just going to want to factor out that negative term. But for this one, it's a little more simple because we can simply divide by negative one. We just have to remember to do it on all of the terms in order to keep the equation balanced. So this would give us a positive x squared minus 12x plus 23 equals, and then zero divided by neg negative one is still zero. So basically what we've done is we've just flipped each of our signs for each of these terms that are over here on the left-hand side of the equation. And the last variation that I want to go over with you is that your equation might not be automatically set equal to zero. And that's okay. We know that whatever this third term is in our trinomial that's on the left-hand side, we're going to get rid of that by adding it or subtracting it in order to cancel it out. So for this one, we would subtract out negative 26 anyways. So we're, we're just going to subtract that from positive eight over on this side. So instead of it just being negative 26 on the right-hand side, it's going to be negative 26 plus eight. So when we simplify that, we get negative 18 over here on this side. And then we could continue 
with our steps of completing the square for this one. Okay guys, thanks so much for joining me. I hope this tutorial was helpful for you. And of course, if you haven't already, please subscribe. Subscribing is the best way to help me keep making these videos for you. If you are looking for one-to-one -one help, I do offer online tutoring services, which allows me to help students all around the world. Just visit my website, mytutoringbee.com for more info about that. Thanks. Bye.